My unboxing video of the Intel Core i9-12900KS didn't take a lot of effort on my part, nice and quick, and it went down very well with the Kitguru audience. So that's great news. Minimum work, maximum return. By contrast, the full review of this processor has taken a huge amount of effort on my part because it's been a rocky ride. So sit down, strap in and enjoy. What exactly is a Core i9-12900KS? The short answer is, it's a slightly faster version of Core i9-12900K. If you haven't already watched or read our review of the Core i9-12900K, I suggest you head off and do so because everything in that review, along with Intel Z690 chipset motherboards and DDR5 memory, all of that applies here. Intel has clearly binned or selected particularly fast processors. They've changed the microcode in the processors and therefore they're identified by the motherboards and they behave slightly differently. For this privilege, you pay considerably more money and you get, hopefully, a slightly better product. We're talking marginal speed improvements. You can expect to see your KS run at 5.2 gigahertz all cores, where your K you might see run at 5 gigahertz all cores. We saw ours run at 4.9 gigahertz all cores. Intel's current architecture has a variety of boosts. You have boosts on top of boosts. So your Core i9-12900K, you'd probably see one core running at 5.2 or 5.3 gigahertz. All cores, 4.9 gigahertz, perhaps 5 gigahertz. Personally, I've seen Core i9-12900K run at 4.9 all core, and you get flashes of a single core at 5.3, but it is momentary. By contrast, the KS, you can expect to see 5.2 gigahertz all cores, and 5.5 gigahertz on two cores. On paper, it's a reasonable step forward. It begs the question, why does the KS exist in the first place? Thing is that with the 12900K, Intel has already got a blazing fast processor, as indeed they claimed at launch, and they were quite correct. So then we got the 12900KS, which rather than being the fastest gaming processor, is apparently the fastest desktop processor. Well, that's a funny thing. What exactly is a desktop processor? Is a Threadripper a desktop processor? If so, it's certainly got more grunt than this. I mean, it's got many times more cores. Or are we talking about faster clock speeds? Well, if that's the case, the 12900K, 4.9 gigahertz all cores, it beats AMD on clock speeds. And those boosts to 5.2 or 5.3 certainly beat AMD. And that surely means that Intel running at 5.2 gigahertz all cores on the performance cores and 5.5 gigahertz on two cores is fighting a battle they've already won. What can have possibly led Intel to decide it was time to bring out a slightly juiced up version of their existing processor? We'll have to just dig into the benchmark results and see what we can find. The motherboard I'm gonna use for my testing of the KS is this Gigabyte Z690 Aorus Master, which I reviewed a few weeks ago and liked a great deal. The thing is that since my review of this board, Gigabyte has updated the BIOS, as you'd expect, a BIOS that supports the KS processor. We've also had some significant updates to Windows 11, and also we've had updates to graphics drivers. So the first thing I have to do before I can get into the KS is to retest the 12900K. Our test PC, Gigabyte Z690 Aorus Master motherboard. SSD is a separate Rocket NVMe 4.0 processor, Core i9-12900K. Thermal compound, Arctic MX4. Memory is 32 gigabytes of Corsair DDR5 5200. Graphics card, Palit Gaming Pro RTX 3080. Power supply, Seasonic Prime TX850. The CPU cooler is a Corsair H150i Elite LCD. The three 120mm fans connected directly to the motherboard and they will rapidly ramp up to 2000 RPM. We'll do a quick run of Cinebench R23 to remind ourselves what the Core i9-12900K does when it's under full load. It settles down to 4.9 GHz all cores 
package power is 211 watts. Temperature is in the mid 70s and the ambient is currently 20 degrees Celsius. Our chart shows the retested Core i9-12900K has made an improvement from the original review figures. However, while it looks like a big leap, we're actually talking about 3%. So nice to have, but not quite as impressive as it might first appear. It's time to plug in the 12900KS and see how that performs on the Gigabyte Z690 Aorus Master. Core i9-12900KS correctly identified in the BIOS. XMP enabled. Starting Cinebench 23. Ambient is 22 degrees. It's got a little bit warmer in here. CPU package power 260 watts. Clock speed 5.0 gigahertz all cores. Package power pulling back to 255 watts. CPU package temp is 84. You can hear the fans are running at full speed. So the clock speed stabilized at 5 gigahertz. Package power just above 250 watts. The score from that run of Cinebench 23 is almost identical to my official test result, which is great for repeatability and adds to my disappointment. Although the KS is drawing significantly more power than the K, in terms of performance in Cinebench 23, there's very little to see for that extra power. I'm going to change from the Gigabyte Z690 Aorus Master to the MSI Meg Z690 Unify and see whether or not that helps the situation. It's clear there's something slightly peculiar going on with the 12900KS on the Gigabyte, so I need to separate motherboard from processor to establish if it's the motherboard that's doing something odd or the processor. This Meg Z690 Unify is a motherboard I used when I did the launch review of the 12900K and it was a good solid platform. So it's coming out of storage, uh, having a BIOS update. I'm slightly disturbed to note the MSI BIOS to support the KS is a beta BIOS rather than a release BIOS, but hey ho. So here we go with the Meg Z690 Unify and beta BIOS along with the 12900KS. BIOS updated, processor correctly recognized, XMP enabled, we're ready to get testing. Here we go, Cinebench 23 on the MSI Meg Unify with the KS. Okay, that looks like a dismal failure. 240 watt CPU package power, temperature straight to 100. Perhaps the problem is neither the motherboard nor, well, kind of the processor, but not the motherboard. Perhaps the problem is the cooling system. What I'm doing is replacing the Corsair 360mm AIO with a custom loop 360mm system. CPU block from Corsair, radiator from EK, fans from Fantex, pump reservoir also from EK, and that bracket there is simply to help it stand up to make life easy. And the fittings are from AlphaCool. So there's a good selection of the cooling industry in one happy union here. Question is, is this gonna tame the KS processor? We're getting serious. CPU package power, 320 and a few watts. Dropping back to 316, temperature still, however, 100 Celsius albeit ambient 23. And now we've got a bit of ping pong going on. The CPU package going from 100 down to 97. You can see the power and temperature kind of cycling as it essentially throttles and then uh, regains its poise. We've got the P cores cycling between 5.1 gigahertz and 5.0 gigahertz. The E cores are rock solid at 4.0 gigahertz. CPU package power is just over 300 watts. Temperature sitting pretty much at 100. So cooling system clearly is a big part of the equation. The result of the Cinebench very close once again to my official test results, which is good for consistency. And now we've got a hint of the narrative. The new KS clearly requires loads of voltage, loads of power, 
and then runs horribly hot, which means you have to chuck a huge amount of cooling at it. This makes sense. However, we're still not seeing speeds in line with Intel's specification. I made a slight error a few moments ago when I said the CPU demands high voltage and high power. It's probably more accurate to say the motherboard manufacturers seem to be feeding it high voltage and as a consequence, an awful lot of power. What happens if we overclock but turn down the voltage? Core voltage 1.275, and then we want to set load line calibration. Let's set it to mode two. So not quite the highest, but let's just make sure it holds up. So overclocking both the P cores and the E cores, although the E cores are just a sideshow, and we are holding the voltage down. And here we go again with Cinebench R23. CPU package power around 245 watts. All the P cores humming away at 5.2 gigahertz. Faster clocks and less power. Hurrah! Package temperature is creeping up, however, power and clock speeds are holding steady. Overclocking the KS, or undervolting the KS at any rate, looks like a good move. That little piece of overclocking has worked well. As you can see in our charts, we're making progress with the KS. The Cinebench score is looking good. Power is under control, and the CPU temperature is slightly less terrifying than it was on auto. With that success under our belts, let us bump up the P-Core ratio one more time into 5.3 gigahertz. And here we go. This may well be the final run of Cinebench R23. Thank goodness. Package power to 50 watts. Clock speeds 5.3 gigahertz on the P cores, 4.1 on the E cores. That's all looking promising. And we have an ambient to 23 degrees, 23.3 as it happens. And the CPU temperature is just about to hit 90. And there we have our results. Cinebench R23, 5.3 gigahertz on all the P cores, 4.1 gigahertz on the E cores. An impressive score and all done on 250 watts of CPU package power. I'm sure you realize I had no intention of spending nine minutes discussing the behavior of this processor running Cinebench R23. My original plan, as I'm sure you will have realized, was to show you the 12900K in action, switch over to the KS, look at the extra performance, the higher clock speeds, and then we could get into a good long discussion about gaming and power draw and temperatures and such like. Instead of which, as you saw, it went totally sideways. So here we are, 10 minutes into my video, and I'm not even touched on the 5.5 gigahertz behavior. So it seems like the kind thing is to show you a little bit of B-roll of this processor running with two cores at 5.5 gigahertz, which certainly looks impressive. It doesn't make a huge difference to the actual performance, but 5.5 gigahertz is a very large number. Let's get into the benchmarks. Cinebench 15 single core. You can see that at the top we have the KS running on auto because it can use that 5.5 gigahertz clock speed, but it is a tiny step up from the overclock KS, which is locked at 5.3 gigahertz or indeed 5.2 gigahertz. Very few points in it, but KS on auto wins. Cinebench R15 multi-core. As you would expect, the overclocked KS at 5.3 GHz beats out the KS at 5.2 GHz. Interestingly, the Ryzen 9 5950X is very slightly behind. In this showing, Intel has beaten AMD in Cinebench R15. Realistically, we can call it a dead heat, but that's good going. And then as we look down the charts, we can see the KS on auto first on the MSI Meg Unify and then on the Gigabyte Aorus Master. Trailing behind the Core i9-12900K, Ryzen 9 5900X and the Ryzen 7 5800X. Moving on to Cinebench 23 single core. It's a clean sweep for the KS at the top of the chart. And again, 
it's the auto behavior at 5.5 gigahertz that wins the day. Cinebench R23 multi-core, the overclocked KS at 5.3 gigahertz at the top of the charts, with a score that is frustratingly close to 30,000. We're not quite there, however. And as you go down the chart, there are very few surprises in store. Bapco Crossmark, the Intel-friendly test. So the KS on auto wins by a very small head over the overclocked KS. Blender 3.1 Classroom. Sadly, we don't have recent figures for the Ryzen 9 5950X in this particular test because Blender was updated. Last time we ran that processor was on 2.9, and that means that AMD's big boy is not represented in these charts. At the top, we have the overclock KS at 5.3 GHz, followed by the KS at 5.2. Behind that, we have the K overclocked at 5 GHz, beating out the KS on auto. And if you look at the top of the chart, you'll see that really there's very little to separate those processors. Handbrake H.264 conversion. The KS tops the chart, and when it's overclocked, you simply cannot beat it for performance. It's the same story with the H.265 conversion in Handbrake. KS at the top of the charts. Clock speed is what it's all about. 3D Mark Time Spy. This is just the CPU element of the test. Once again, it's all about clock speed. The KS beats out the K, but you will see there's not a lot at the very top of the chart to separate one processor from the other. Gaming. Far Cry 6 at 1080p. As we know, 1080p gaming is about processor rather than graphics. And the KS on the Meg Unify on auto does very nicely. If you go down to third place, you'll see an anomaly, which is the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D. It has a very high average speed, while the minimum is not that impressive. So, I'm telling you that KS did particularly well, and the 3D is a fly in the ointment. Far Cry 6 at 1440p. It's the KS's at the top of the charts, regardless of whether it's on auto or overclocked. Again, if you look down the page, you'll see the 5800X 3D sticks out very slightly. High average, low minimum. Realistically, all of these processors are doing a very fine job at 1440p. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy at 1080p. We don't have a huge amount of data to work on here. You can see that the KS beats out the K just as you'd expect, and that overclocked is better than auto. There is a healthy amount of separation between the different settings, and this is telling us that raw power makes a lot of difference, but all of these processors are running over 200 FPS, which is clearly huge. By contrast, Guardians of the Galaxy at 1440p, there's essentially nothing to choose between them. Watch Dogs Legion at 1080p. We expect 1080p gaming to be all about the processor, and look what's at the top of the chart. That Ryzen 7 3D. Again, not a lot to choose between them, but the win goes to AMD, followed by the overclocked KS. Surprisingly, it's the 5.2 GHz overclock, just beating out the 5.3, which suggests that 5.2 is completely stable. 5.3 might be a fraction wobbly. Watch Dogs Legion at 1440p. Well, it's all over the place here. We've got the Ryzen 7 at the top of the chart, the regular Ryzen 7, that is. Then we have the Ryzen 9, followed by some Core i9KS figures, followed by the Ryzen 7 3D. Not a lot to choose between any of these processors, but the order here looks almost random. And then we come on to the technical tests. So CPU temperature, this is delta temperature over ambient, which was around about 20 degrees, give or take. It varied from 19 to 21 during the testing. You can see the coolest processor was the regular Core i9-12900K, and then we get into the KS on AIO cooling, followed by the KS overclocked at 5.3 GHz on custom loop. Then we have the KS overclocked at 5.2 GHz on custom loop, because those two processor settings ran exactly the same temperature. Then we have the KS on the MSI Meg Unify, with custom loop cooling, running on auto, but with manual V-Core. 245 watts, as you can see in the note there. Next up, second from the hottest on the chart, we have the KS on the Meg Unify on auto, 305 watts. That's 60 watts difference from resetting the V-Core. 
and you can see that it makes 8 Celsius difference to the CPU package temperature. If you're buying a KS, you will seriously want to consider setting the vCore manually. And then the hottest in the chart is the Core i9-12900K overclocked with AIO cooling. 81 degrees there, add on 19 for ambient, we're talking 100 Celsius for the package. And then we have power consumption. This is CPU package power, not system power draw. You want to add on 250 to 300 watts for the graphics and the system. About 550 watts at the wall socket in many of the cases. Down at the bottom of the charts we have AMD, which as we know are much more efficient than Intel. Then we have the Auto Core i9-12900K pulling 213 watts for the package. 12900KS overclocked at 5.2 GHz takes 241 watts. Setting the vCore manually on the KS and leaving it on Auto, 245 watts. KS overclocked at 5.3 GHz, it's in the same ballpark, 248 watts. The KS on the Gigabyte on Auto, 250 watts. And then the KS on Auto on the Meg Unify, 305 watts. That difference between 250 watts and 305 watts on Auto, that's all down to the different buyer settings. What do I think of the Intel Core i9-12900KS? Pros, the good points. Stunning performance. Does really well in our test charts. The other good point, the Z690 platform with DDR5, it's a good platform. Decent I.O., high performance, seems solid and stable. Cons, the bad points. So much power and so much heat. This processor tops the charts in terms of performance and in terms of the bad stuff. Bias support is patchy. I've got a degree of sympathy here for, uh, in this instance, Gigabyte and MSI. I can't speak at this moment for ASRock and for Asus and the other manufacturers. This is a single processor, which is obviously based very, very, very closely on the 12900K, which was already a hot and juicy processor. I've got no idea how much development time the motherboard manufacturers have to do the BIOS to support this processor. They must surely be thinking to themselves the potential market for this processor is absolutely tiny. After all, the Core i9 you wouldn't expect to sell in huge numbers in the first place. Uh, and this is a niche, niche, niche product. And they're probably thinking to themselves, realistically, anyone spending the money for this processor is going to be using proper cooling and they're going to tweak the settings manually. They're not going to run it on auto. And it seems to me the auto settings are just something to get the motherboard working with this processor and then it's over to you. I wish they'd actually said as much uh, and hadn't sort of listed it just uh, without a warning note. In a way, MSI kind of cover themselves by calling it a beta bias because it needs help. So bias support is patchy. That's another way of saying for goodness sake, get in there and sort out the settings to your processor. And finally, the value for money argument is awful. Well, yes, I mean, you're paying a huge premium for this processor. I think we know why it costs so much. But hey ho, if you're a true enthusiast, the extra money, it's a mere detail. You probably spent a fortune on your PC. Graphics cards cost the absolute earth. High end motherboards are expensive. The cooling system you're going to require to cool this processor that's loads of money. What is a few hundred pounds between friends?